Hello, everybody. I'm Ricky Smith, and this is Faith on Friday Presents. At Faith on Friday Presents, we're all about highlighting inspiring people, engaging topics, and small businesses that need to be highlighted. And while you're here, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share our content. We want everybody to know what we got going on. Today is going to be a little different. I'm excited and a little nervous, but it's not a bad thing. So we have all had or know people who have gone through childbirth journeys, trying to be pregnant, having babies, and getting them up and out the house. That's just me. But what have you known or who have you known and what do you know about going through that journey and losing your kid? Today, I want to introduce you to a phenomenal woman who is willing to share her story about her journey to get pregnant and losing a child and the miracle at the end. Y'all, please say hello to my friend, Jessica Hammock. Hey, Jessica. Hey, <laughs> thanks for having me today. So excited. So, thank you so much for being here. I This story is so important because there are so many, not just women, but couples, men, go through this as well. So Jessica, yes. we're going to start a little bit by just tell us a little bit about your trying to be pregnant journey. Where and when did this all start? Yeah. So like so many people say, it started after I got married or six months in or 12 months in. I, I know for me that it started, I think I was about seven. <laughs> and I say that because um, you know, they asked you that question in high school, like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And the only thing that I can ever remember wanting to be was a mom. And I mm -hmm. say it started at six or seven because the biggest memories I have of being a child was literally like pushing my shopping cart around with all my dolls in. Right. And there was literally nothing else that ever appealed to me. Like, what do you want to grow be a, be when you grow up? I want to be a mom. Like oh. I kind of found a way to find a career, but <laughs> you know, it was, it was just, it was the backup plan, honestly, to have the wow. career. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of where it all started for us officially. And, yeah. you know, then life gets tumbling along and we find ourselves not having that desire fulfilled the oh, same wow. way. So that's crazy. I, you know, I, I think of, you know, like you said, people say, what do you want to be when you grow up? I One day I'll have to tell people what I said I wanted to be when I grew up because it's hilarious. But to be a mom, is it something, you know, I had the great parents in the world. I want to be a mommy. I saw it on TV. Look at being a mom looked like it was going to be the world's glamorous lifestyle. Why a mommy? I honestly... I don't know that I knew the depth of why I wanted that as a child. I had good parents. I grew up in a Christian home. Um, I had good grandparents. My mom actually worked away from home and my dad was a farmer. So I spent a lot of time with my grandmother. Mm. I think when I figured this out was much more into this journey that we've been on, where for me, it was the desire to leave a legacy, uh. to have something beyond myself that it wasn't just about me being present in this world, mm -hmm. but it was really about me when I leave this world that I've left a piece of myself here and there's an imprint of me somewhere here that can continue on. Oh my gosh. So for you all who are watching, if you haven't figured out already, <laughs> get the tissue. It's a real <laughs> thing, y'all. Jessica, that is amazing to think that I want to leave a legacy. Mm -hmm. I wanted something greater yeah. than me to be left behind. Yeah. Now we've talked a little bit about this on and on, and I'm going to touch on something that we didn't talk about in the interview, but I think it's worth talking about. Mm -hmm. If you can briefly tell me a little bit about you as a child and, and some of the things that really broke your heart growing up. Yeah, for me, I think the biggest thing was I, um, I had a lot of expectations on me, leading me as the oldest child, um, a lot of um, expectations to look a certain way, to be a certain way in, in terms of academics, performance, show up a certain way um, to make the family look good. Mm. So while I didn't in, endure any of these big abusive situations that a lot of people talk about, for me, the 
the trauma to my heart and mind and life really came from this identity piece where I just never felt like I was good enough um, mm. as a girl, as a daughter, as a friend, a lot, all those roles that we play was yeah. just, my identity was really in crisis mode a lot. And so then it came to this thing of like being a mom mm. and that was a, um, an even bigger piece of the journey is like the very thing I meant to do as a woman, I now can't do. Right. Oh, and that, that to me is just so poignant at one of the things you said, you know, as a woman, you know, because there are a few things that make us girls, right? Yes. And I laugh in myself because of the truth. There are boobies yes. and babies. Yes. And when, Very much. you know, when you feel like, like you said, when you felt like you could not fulfill this thing, mm -hmm. what did that make you feel about yourself? Oh, I think it just it just shattered any hope I had, I guess, it, to a degree. It just, mm -hmm. it was devastating. Like it was, there were, there's been a lot of aspects of my story that have been big faith moments that I've been asked to really trust God in. Mm -hmm. That was the one that I have struggled the hardest with and the longest with, because it was, I guess, uh, the enemy really used it to set, to, to, be a confirmation piece to say see like this is all the stuff that's been spoken over you all of these years this is true too mm -hmm. like this is the thing you want the most you'll never have it because of all the things that were spoken over you before right you know yeah. you're not worth it you can't do it until you change everything about your life and how you show up and fix yourself you'll never have access to this thing and it was very difficult to navigate from a faith aspect because I would just I really struggled to understand why the Lord would allow me to have this desire right. if it wasn't resolving itself and there were many times I asked him just to take it away yeah. because it was it would be much easier the perception was it would be much easier mm -hmm. if I didn't have this desire to have children than to have it and go unfulfilled and the scripture talks about that you know that mm -hmm. um our hope being unfulfilled and yeah. really creating a heart sickness. Yeah. And I definitely hope had deferred, a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's horrible. So we're going to move forward quite a bit because yeah. you meet this amazing guy. Yeah. You get married. <laughs> yes. And now we're going to make babies. Right. What <laughs> happened then? So three, well, so a couple things happened. Three years into our journey, my husband had a traumatic brain injury. And so that kind of really put a halt on things. We had a year and a half worth of recovery. And after that year and a half worth of recovery, we decided, okay, let's try to be intentional about moving forward with our family. And we found that I had some physical things in the way. We went to the doctor, we took some shots, we took some pills and we got pregnant. And mm. so, um, but we were pregnant less than two months mm. at that point. Um, and so I was definitely way more devastated than he was, which I didn't understand till much later, the difference in the grief journey that a husband faces than a yeah. wife faces. Mm. Um, but I did what any normal human being would do when they have a devastating loss. And that's went back to school for a master's degree, you know, like well, why, yeah, <laughs> why face this? Let's just change course. Let's do something else big and monumentous that requires a whole lot of capacity in it and forget the fact that this just happened. Yeah. Wow. Sorry. And what did you get your master's in? In counseling. Oh, well, of course. <laughs> you know, why like, bother? <laughs> why bother taking counseling myself? Let me just go out and learn to fix other people because I don't yeah. have a problem at this point. Um, oh my gosh. Yeah. Nothing's yeah. wrong with me. It's them. Yeah. So we've lost this first baby. Mm -hmm. So we start going through treatments again. What yes. was that like for you in your heart and in your mind? Um, so we, I actually had a long time of like avoiding even going through treatments. I got really physically sick, actually did some heart work, finally got some healing, was back on track, but it's like every month, I think the difficult part about infertility is like every month you're faced with loss again, and it's mm -hmm. little loss after little loss after little loss. And it's like, how do you 
it's like a, a race you run an endurance race for like how do you keep showing up for something that could potentially end in a loss or a, a death every single month like every 30 days we're gonna ramp up and we're gonna crash ramp up and crash and it was just it, that was the difficult part so we did regular treatments we're not sure over some of my medical diagnosis, actually, if I had more pregnancies, we believe I may, but mm -hmm. that eventually led us to doing um, inf IVF. Mm -hmm. And we, that was right in the midst of COVID. So we had started and stopped cycles several times, mm -hmm. which was like, are we, we're like this close and are we ever going to get there? And um, we finally, after uh, a year and a half of doing those treatments, we had another pregnancy and um so excited i think like at that point the the hope factor was like ridiculously high yeah. and so it felt amazing um but it um 8 weeks into it we lost the heartbeat oh wow and so it just was definitely a different sort of crash than we anticipated and this mm -hmm. one was much bigger than just my husband and i it yeah. was kind of like that tsunami effect where it just a ripple effect where it just impacted it was devastating to our family to our friends to not just us so it was not just navigating our own grief at this point wow. it was navigating the grief of all the other people that were emotionally invested with us yeah and that has got to be so hard because you hear so many couples that go through these infertility treatments and going through IVF yeah. and going through, like you said, the roller coaster, the ups yeah. and downs, the avoiding other pregnant people, yes. avoiding talking to other people yeah. about <laughs> it. And then, like you said, and now we're pregnant and everyone knows because everyone's been on this journey. Yeah. And now we're not. Yeah. At what point did you say, you know what, Lord, I guess it wasn't for me. I um don't know that I ever officially said that. When we had that loss after the IVF, we of course did what every normal human being does. And we totally went to another big thing and decided to buy a house. But yeah. <laughs> you know, like yeah, yeah. why why stay stuck here? Um I don't know that I ever said that, but I, what I do know is I felt like IVF was I wouldn't say our last chance, mm -hmm. but the big thing that I was counting on and we have other embryos, but the finances for that piece of our life wasn't set right. aside. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of like this weird emotional place where it was like, there's still this little hope because we have six embryos left, but at the same mm -hmm. time, like it's so close. You can almost taste it, but you can't, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. like prevented from accessing it in a way. Right. And so I don't know that I actually ever really thought about like, we're done, mm -hmm. but I knew we were done for a season. And I think that was harder to navigate as like, I don't even know when I get a chance to try this again. Yeah. You mentioned and, something that a lot of people don't think of, you know, in this conversation, IVF ain't free. No. And it's not covered by most insurances in most states. It is looked at as a, in fact, some insurances, if you have specific diagnosis or they write infertility on your paperwork, even if mm -hmm. you're going to a regular OB, mm -hmm. will actually deny any claim related to any support, even if it's a prior approved medication. Wow. So you've got the emotional, yes. the physical, and the financial yeah. to deal with all at the same time. Yeah. Wow. We're going <laughs> to skip ahead some more because there's so much in this. So let's skip to the part where, oh my gosh, <laughs> this is the one where we are pregnant. Tell us a yes. little bit about that day. So we, um, we, like I said, we were buying a house and or I, we actually ended up building a house in the week we were set to close. I was feeling really exhausted. My cycle was late. Everything felt off. And I, knew it was stress, but I was like, well, we're about to move and I'm still not started. Like what in the world's going on? And one of the really unhealthy habits that happens when you're trying to have a baby mm -hmm. is that every time you get close to your cycle, you take a test. And sometimes mm -hmm. it was like, the joke was, let's just take the test. So my cycle will start and we can move on. Right. <laughs> um, 
And so that's kind of what I was trying to do. Like, let's just take the test. My cycle will start, my body will relax and I can move on. And I took the test and it showed pregnant. And I was like, what, what? And so I called my friend, one of my closest friends. And I was like, what, what do I do? And she's like, what do you mean? What do you do? Like you celebrate. And I'm like, no, but like, seriously, like, what do I do? Like, this has never happened like this before. So I went to the doctor. I didn't tell anybody else, but her, Mm. I went to the doctor the next day, got the blood work. And then two days later, we were actually sitting in the title office to sign for our house when the doctor Mm. called and I told my husband, I got to take this. Mm-hmm. And, um, he knew that I was getting my hormones checked. He said, thank mm-hmm. God you've been a hot mess. <laughs> and <laughs> so they called and they told me I was pregnant. So I was trying not to like be ecstatic mm-hmm. in the title office. So I come back in, he's like, what the doctor say? I said, he said, everything's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, sign I for this house. We'll talk yeah, later. <laughs> yeah. I didn't want to tell everybody in the title office. It right. was unique to us, but it was, um, so interesting telling all of our immediate family because Mm -hmm. the response across the board was we didn't know you were doing shots what do you mean you're pregnant like you're having a baby like did you adopt are you like Mm -hmm. why haven't you shared this and I'm like because we didn't do any shots we didn't do anything like I'm just pregnant wow Wow. and so just kind of letting um the miracle of that sink in and and really navigating that piece of things and there was a lot of anxiety and fear in the beginning. And I, I finally prayed and I'm sometimes I'm very frank with the Lord. And I'm like, look, either we're doing this or we're not. Mm. Um, I, I'm not going to do this halfway and yeah. uh, I'm not going to, I can't. And I'm just asking you right now, like either we're committing to this full term or we're not. Yeah. And I need that to be the non-negotiable. <laughs> Some people are like, you just go, you're a little too bold with the Lord. But- no, they, he can handle it. He's all right. <laughs> and um, I just got that reassurance. God doesn't do miracles halfway. No. And that was the promise he gave to me. And that was every time somebody worried, my family would worry, you know, my husband would worry. Other people would be concerned just in general because of our history and everything. I'm like, look, God doesn't do miracles halfway. I and love that. That is God the piece does not that do miracles halfway. Mm. It just doesn't. No. And so our non halfway miracle is 14 months old. Her name what? is Hope Elizabeth. What? <laughs> I love that so much. And that is, that is just the reward, if you will, of the diligence and the faith in doing it. But I want to take you back just a little bit, Jessica, because there's something that I really want you to touch on. Yeah. When you found out that you were having a little girl. Ugh. I know. And it's a lot. Share with us a little bit about, about that part for you. Cause I I just think that's incredible. Yeah. Um, because of just so much that I went through in my own identity work in the beginning of my life and throughout it, I resisted having a girl and, um, we had friends point out several times they thought our IVF baby was a girl and I was like angry about it. And the Lord and I had a real intense fellowship moment. And I said, I do not want a girl. And, and his basically conversation with me is like, why do you not want a girl? Mm -hmm. And I was like, I, I don't want to ruin her. Mm -hmm. And I know that part of this journey was his working that out in me Mm and recognizing that if he trusted me to be this baby's mama, he knew what it would take. But right. at the moment it was like, I, I, when I came face to face with finally owning, what was that fear? Mm-hmm. And um, he said to me, it is, I have equipped you not just to be their mom, but to recognize it's not about the sex of the child that you have, but about the identity of who they are in me. And what I want you to focus on is raising them to find their identity in me and letting that be the thing that it doesn't matter. You're not going to ruin them. I trusted you with this journey for them. And I've equipped you up until this point to have the pieces to lead them in finding that, discovering it and walking it out in this time, in this earth, right at this exact moment. And uh, it was 
definitely a humbling conversation. <laughs> it's not nearly as bold as the other one, but you know, but I love it that you you had the wherewithal to have a conversation with the creator who created <laughs> you and who's created hope <laughs> and all these things to say, I don't want to ruin her. And him saying, you got this basically because I got you. I, I just think that is so yeah. incredible. <laughs> you know, the, the conversation is going to go on and we have a little bit more, but Jessica, I know you have a business and thing, but there are a lot of people watching this mm -hmm. who, who just don't know where to go or what to talk to. If someone wanted to encourage you, ask you a question or just, con or just continue the conversation with you, where can they find you? Yeah, probably you can find me all over Facebook, Instagram, podcast, all those things. And I know you'll give the links. You can email me at vibrantvoice20 at gmail.com. Awesome. And like she said, don't worry if you didn't get it because we're going to put it all in the description below. And yeah. don't forget, if you or someone you know has an inspiring story, a topic we absolutely have to talk about, or a small business that needs to be highlighted, go over to our website at faithonfriday.com. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and to share. Now, Jessica, my friend, before I let you go, <laughs> we have to play a game. Sure. I love games. I know, girl. So the game is called This or That, and it's really okay. simple. I'm going to give you the choice of two things, and you, off the top of your head, just tell me which one you like the best. Sure. Are you ready to play? I'm ready. Here we go. <laughs> Flowers or plants? Flowers. Hotel or tent? Hotel. I know, girl, right? <laughs> Ugh. <laughs> water park or amusement park water park mm. practical joker or i don't play like that practical joker oh my god <laughs> poor little hope my poor little baby girl anyway candlelight or moonlight oh moonlight mm. planner or i make it up as i go mostly planner okay go all day or i need a nap I need a nap. <laughs> My favorite thing is a nap, girl. When you're talking, do you say pecan or pecan? Oh, depends who I'm talking to, actually. Okay. <laughs> I've got some people that say pecan and some people that say pecans, and so they'll correct me, so I adjust. Oh, my God. I love it so much. Now, that's new. When you meet somebody, what's the first thing you notice, their eyes or their smile? Their shoes. Of course, because that was one of the choices. Thank you. <laughs> and and the, all the rest style. of us are going, I know, right? <laughs> Usually their smile, but I, I don't have shoes. Yeah, I'm with the shoe part, girl. I'm not even mad. So are you a words of affirmation person or are you more of an acts of service kind of gal? Words of affirmation. Yeah, I like it. And finally, what would you tell your 13-year-old self right now? You get a choice. It doesn't matter what anybody would say to you or anybody does to you. You get a choice. That's so good. Before I let you go, I know people are wondering, and I'm going to let you tell them, why are you wearing a crown? <laughs> you know, that identity piece that I talked about a couple of times, it's just part of my identity journey. And on that journey, I always had a head knowledge of what the Bible says of who I am. Mm -hmm. But in that, the Lord and I had a real, real conversation. And he shared with me that I am a daughter of the king, carry uh, arrayed in splendor and crowned with his glory. And I carry the sword of the spirit. So Ooh. ever since then, I'm like, shoot, yeah, I am wearing my crown. Girl, <laughs> you're not... <laughs> All I needed I was it. an excuse, girl. There you go. <laughs> That's good. Thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate you, my friend. Yes, thank you for letting me. It is my pleasure. You all, that's it for this time. But don't worry, we'll be back with more Faith on Friday Presents.